Grace and peace to you from God the Father, His Son, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, through the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Show them what you're made of. Those are often the words of a parent or a grandparent offering encouragement to a youngster about to engage in some kind of competition. Too often, what we are made of is revealed to us at a very young age by others who are also at a very young age. Big brothers challenging little brothers to see what they are made of. Or upperclassmen badgering underclassmen to see what they're made of. Are you filled with courage or cowardice? An eighth grader helped me see what I was made of when I was in the seventh grade. An unsanctioned form of initiation for 7th graders at Jasper High School was to be tossed into the thorn-riddled rose bushes planted on each side of the steps used to enter the school. No one ever did anything about this either. We knew it was going to happen. There wasn't any way that you could avoid it. You might temporarily delay the thorn toss if you could outmaneuver those predators, but in time, there was a good chance you would be pierced by those natural needles, courtesy of someone stronger, taller, and usually more determined than you. A few days into the new school year, the 322 dismissal bell rang. School was over. I hightailed it to the south exit, the one with the roses adorning each side of those concrete steps. I was confronted by an eighth grader who appeared to have about 30 pounds on me, and seemed to be about a foot taller. I felt like a young African wildebeest that became separated from the protective herd. There was no chance of escape. All I could do was grab one of the two iron railings that, anchor, that were anchored in the steps. In a rare feat of strength and bravery, I showed Todd, the eighth grader, what I was made of. Although I was outmuscled by this farm boy, I refused to let go, and he eventually gave up. I never was impaled by those bushes. Even seventh graders need a victory once in a while. God wanted Ezekiel to show the children of Israel what he, God, was made of. And like usual, God gave the assignment to a reluctant prophet. He almost always does. God shows himself, at least an image of himself, to Ezekiel. And this description in chapter 1 is unlike anything we would think God might look like. Here are some of the terms that are used. He describes him as a whirlwind, a great cloud, a raging fire, the likeness of four living creatures with four faces and four wings, burning coals, all the while moving on a wheel that's inside a wheel. I prefer Michelangelo's depiction of God as he painted him in the 16th century on the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel. That shows God leaning toward a laid-back Adam, index finger reaching index finger but not touching. God was gray-haired and very muscular. Adam was reclined as though he was waiting for God to do something for him. It's a far cry from the image described in Ezekiel chapter 1. Now Ezekiel sees this image of God and he falls on his face. And God says, Son of man, I'm sending you to a rebellious nation. My people have become obstinate and they are stubborn. You will go and you will say, this is what the sovereign Lord says. God tells Ezekiel to speak the word of the Lord. And whether they hear the word or refuse the word, they will know that a prophet has been among them. He tells him, don't be afraid of them. Don't be afraid of their words. Don't even be afraid of the look on their faces. And then in chapter 3, God tells him to eat a scroll filled with God's word. Fill your belly with it, he says, and speak my words telling him what you're made of, Ezekiel, is the word. What you're made of is the instruction from me, the God of all creation. 
Ezekiel would spend his lifetime showing what he was made of. He was made of tenacity, bravery, and purpose, all provided by God, all necessary to be a prophet of God. Have you eaten a scroll lately? Have you eaten a page of your Bible lately? Very unlikely. We are told that we are what we eat, sort of. Actually, elementally, 90, 99% of what we are is made up of oxygen, carbon, hydrogen, and nitrogen. But we are much more than the elements that make up our physical body. We are soul and spirit. We are mind and body. Oftentimes, it's the body part of our life that keeps us humble and dependent on God. And that was the case for the Apostle Paul. He knew that he had to keep his pride in check. Paul had a, a vision similar to Ezekiel's, but his vision, Paul's, was of heaven. He heard and saw things he couldn't describe or express. He couldn't put words to his experience. And he cries out to God about this thorn in his flesh. And Paul pleaded three times for it to be removed, and God refused. Instead, God used the thorn to make Paul perfect in his weakness. If there was to be any boasting, it would be only in the power of Christ. That's why, like Paul, we delight in weaknesses. We delight in hardships, in persecutions, and in difficulties. No, we don't. Why does Jesus want to send us through life from a position of weakness? It's okay for Paul, but doesn't he want us to go forth making disciples of all nations with confidence and strength? The Bible study answer is no, he does not. If Jesus thought we could do significant kingdom work from a position of comfort and plenty, he would never have sent his disciples out two by two with nothing but the clothes on their back and a stick in their hands. Jesus called the twelve and said, go. He gave them authority over evil spirits and said, good luck. No. No. Jesus doesn't work in luck, and neither should we. Jesus works in faith, in obedience, and in blessing, as should we. Jesus tells them, take nothing but a staff. I'm assuming as a line of defense. Take no bread, don't bring a duffel bag, no cash, no coins. Wear only the shoes that are on your feet, and don't slow yourselves down by bringing an extra coat. When you are welcomed into a home, stay there until it is time to leave. If you are not welcomed to that town or to that home, shake the dust off your feet, leave, and go to the next. Such odd instructions. Oh, to have the faith that God will provide for our journey by having us rely on Him and the people and the places that he puts in our path. Jesus was determined to show the disciples and the people that they were destined to rely on what they were made of, what he made them to be. He made them his word. He made them obey his instruction. And he showed them that they would be a blessing from God. Ezekiel ingested God's word through his mouth. We are to ingest God's word with our eyes, our ears, our minds, and our hearts. When we are made of the word made flesh, Jesus Christ, we are the beneficiaries of the life, the death, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. What are you made of? As a follower of Jesus Christ, you are no longer just oxygen, carbon, hydrogen, and nitrogen. Some scientists believe those elements were created during a Big Bang or from inside the star billions and billions of years ago. You were not. 
you were created by God, planned for eternity, then because of the fall, you were destined for hell. Destined for hell because of your inherent sin. But, this is the most beautiful but, (laughs) you are forgiven by a son and a savior who took your punishment and your death. Jesus died on a cross that was meant for you. He was buried in your grave. And then he walked out of that grave as a living example of what lengths God is willing to go to to make sure that you can live in his holy temple, a place that we call heaven. Now you are destined for eternity. Destined for eternity with him, with his son, And with all of those saints who have gone before you because of your faith, which is a gift from God. One day, the bell of our life, indicating the end of class, that bell will ring. And because of God's word, which is what you are made of, because of his word, thorns will be removed. And as Revelation 21.4 tells us, He will wipe every tear from our eyes. There will be no more death, no more sorrow, no more crying, no more pain. All these things will be gone forever. Thanks be to God. Amen.